There we go. We have 10 people in the waiting room and it's 12.59. So um, I can start admitting folks if you're ready. Sure. Okay. It's always fun to see whose names pop in and trickle up. We'll be starting momentarily. Welcome, everybody. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Oh man, I forgot how disorienting this is trying to admit and talk to pe talk to you all. But I think we're gonna get going here. Um, might as well. So good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to today's webinar. I'm using the ADA to support children, youth and families involved in the child welfare system. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's presentation is supported by the Division of the Public Defenders, so thank you for that, and organized by the Center for Children's Advocacy. The, the Center is uh, New England's largest children's legal rights organization, providing legal representation and advocacy for children and youth who are at risk. Uh, I'm Stacy Schleif, I'm the director of our Child Welfare Project. So our objectives over the next hour or so today uh, include a discussion about what the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, what that is and its context within the child welfare system. Uh, we're going to learn how to invoke the ADA in your child welfare cases and how to follow up on any requests that are made. Um, and discuss some specific examples of case situations where the ADA can be utilized, as well as reasonable modifications that can be requested for our parent and child clients. Uh, just some quick logistics before I introduce our presenters today. Um, all participants should be on mute, and please feel free to put any questions that come up in our chat. Uh, we'll save time at the end for them, but also might be able to sneak them in uh, as we're going. So just don't hesitate to post them during the presentation as you think of them. Um, and just lastly, our webinar is going to be recorded and available on our website, as well as by email, I think, uh, at a later date. 
So, all right, without further ado, um, although I can't see them, but hopefully you're out there somewhere, um, our presenters. Okay, now I see you, perfect. Um, so first up, we'll hear from Robin Powell, who is joining us from Oklahoma today. Uh, Robin's a law professor whose scholarship focuses on disability law and policy, health law and policy, as well as family law. She's dedicated her career to advancing the rights of people with disabilities. Currently, she's an associate professor at the University of Oklahoma College of Law, where she teaches courses on family law, disability law, professional responsibility, among others. She's also a co-investigator at the National Research Center for Parents with Disabilities, um, and for nearly five years served as an attorney advisor at the National Council on Disability, which is an independent federal agency that advises the President and Congress on matters concerning people with disabilities. Um, I saw on YouTube earlier that she um, has even spoken at the White House on such issues, so very neat. Um, Robin has written and presented extensively on the rights, needs, and experiences of parents with disabilities, and I'll put a plug in, she'd serve as a great expert witness in the area. Um, I personally came, first came across Robin's uh, expertise while I was working at the Public Defender's Office up in Massachusetts, um, and she served as an expert witness for the Sarah Gordon case, which is a pseudonym. Um, back in 2015 or so that my colleagues at the time had also played a big role in. Um, if any of you haven't heard of the Sarah Gordon case, I would suggest that you Google it. You'll come across many articles that have been written about the landmark child welfare case involving the ADA uh, in which the US Department of Justice ultimately got involved and investigated the ways in which DCF was discriminating against a parent with a disability, denying her reunif reunification and supportive services. Um, with Robin's help and after a thorough investigation, the Department of Justice, along with the US Department of Health and Human Services, issued a letter uh, harshly taking DCF to task, uh, accusing them of violating the mother's civil rights and practicing illegal discrimination. So we'll hear more from Robin about that and her involvement in a bit, um, but it was very impressive work. Um, our, our other presenter today is CCA's very own Bonnie Roswig. She's the director of our Medical Legal Partnerships uh, Disability Rights Project. Her office is located at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Um, Bonnie was named C the Connecticut Law Tribune's 2019 Giant Slayer for her nationwide success in securing access to kinder care facilities for children with diabetes. She's received the Connecticut US Attorney Award for her successful efforts to ensure access to playgrounds for children with disabilities and for all of her work on advancing disability rights in the state. So uh, you all are in very good hands today and I will turn the floor over now to them. Um, we'll start by hearing from Robin to get, I guess, a general overview of the ADA, its application to the child welfare arena, and with some examples about, I guess, re reasonable modifications that um, can be requested. Does that sound about right? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, go for it. All right, thank you so much. And if someone can switch the slide. Okay, so as, you just heard from Stacy. my name is Robin Powell, and one thing I will note is I'm originally from Massachusetts, so I am not originally from Oklahoma. I've only been here for 10 months, I think, um, so I do not have the Oklahoma accent. I, you will definitely hear my Boston accent come out, I'm sure, at times, um, and so as you heard, I have done a lot of work on really the rights of parents with disabilities. I got involved in this originally in um, 2011 when I was working at the National Council on Disability and I was asked to do a um, some research on discrimination against parents with disabilities. I really knew nothing about what that even meant, um, but I of course said yes because I was a new attorney 
Um, and I thought, oh, I'll just write a quick little report and I will move on in my life. Um, well, that quick little report took a year and it was 345 pages, the rocking the cradle report, and I have never moved on. Um, so I am very much committed to these issues. Um, and I think that I do have an interesting perspective um, because not only am I an attorney, I'm also a former social worker um, before I went to law school. And probably most importantly, I am a woman with a disability. So I come at this from three very unique perspectives um, and at times conflicting perspectives. So as you heard, my plan for today is to talk about how the Americans with Disabilities Act really does apply to cases um, within the child welfare system. My work focuses on parents with disabilities, but of course that's more broad to families um, because parents have children. Um, so when you're thinking about this, you wanna think about the whole family perspective. I really think that you cannot separate family rights, uh, parent rights from children's rights. So I think we need to look at it through a family rights perspective. So the first question then is sort of who is a person with a disability under the ADA? And I also add section 504 because section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act um, has very similar mandates and applies whenever the entity receives federal funding and child welfare agencies receive federal funding. So you can use both the ADA and 504. Um, and I would encourage you to do both. I'm going to primarily talk about the ADA, but everything I say pretty much also applies to Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and that starts with the definition. So there are three ways you can um, satisfy the definition of a person with a disability under the ADA. The first is to have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. This is incredibly broad, um, and it's really what I tell my students, it's the actual disability prong. This is the, the person actually has a disability. The second way you can satisfy the definition is by having a record of having such an impairment. This would be someone like um, someone who's in remission from cancer. So before, historically, they did have an impairment that would meet the actual definition, but now they don't. They're in remission, but they're still being discriminated based on that history or that record of previously having a disability. And then the third one is being regarded as having such an impairment. In this instance, the person does not actually have an impairment that substantially limits one or major life, more major life activities. It just doesn't he hit that threshold, and yet they're still being discriminated. This might be someone who has maybe depression or anxiety, but it's not so disabling that it really substantially limits one or more major life activities, but they're being treated as if it does um, because of that, or they're being perceived as having a disability even though they do not. So these are the three ways in which we can meet the definition of a disability under the ADA. Can someone switch the slide? So this is just a broader understanding of sort of who is protected by the ADA. As I said, it's very broad. So it's people are, um, who have physical disabilities, people who have sensory disabilities, that would be someone who maybe is deaf or has um, hard of hearing or blind or has low vision, anyone with a speech disability, anything that affects their sensor, um, senses. The next kind, and I think one of the most common within the child welfare system is people who have intellectual or developmental disabilities. And these are categorized by significant limitations, both in intellectual functioning, as well as adaptive behavior. Um, to have an intellectual or developmental disability, it must originate before the age of 21. Um, they generally use an IQ test to determine um, whether one has an intellectual disability. I will note here in, a, in the future, um, it is a terrible measurement, um, particularly when related to parenting abilities but that is how they um, diagnose someone with an intellectual disability. And most parents who have an intellectual disability really have really mild or even borderline cognitive disabilities. Um, research shows that most people that are sort of assumed to have an intellectual disability or fit into this category really have an IQ of about 80 or below. Um, so that is really mild or borderline. Um, generally, we accepted sort of 70 as the cutoff, but really if you add um, those 10 points, you can sort of get the borderline individuals. And that's who we do see in the um, child welfare system. So it is not people who have really, really significant um, impairments. It is generally people who have an IQ between the ages of, about, I mean, the IQ score between about 60 and 80. 
the next category, which is again, also quite prevalent in the child welfare system is psychiatric and mental health disabilities. And this can include things such as depression or anxiety, um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or any sort of psychotic disorder. And this is really an impairment that would substantially limit major life activities such as parenting or social functioning, or it could impact major bodily function, um, such as regulating your mood or decision-making. So that is how you determine sort of whether a psychiatric um, impairment really reaches the level of disability under the ADA. And finally, I think it is really important to talk about substance use. Um, substance use disorder is protected under the ADA with several caveats. Um, so current and illegal use of drugs um, does limit the protection. Um, so generally, the ADA only um, protects people who are not currently or illegally using substances. That is very gray area. Um, there's no definition of current, for example, and courts are all over the place with what current is. Um, but, you know, as long as you are sort of not seen as actively using, you generally would be protected um, from the, by the ADA. Um, and Title II protects, uh, prohibits discrimination against people with substance use disorder based solely on the fact that they have previously used. Um, there is an argument to be made. Um, so as I said, the use of current is very vague and very gray. Um, many folks are really arguing that relapse is part of recovery, so it should still be considered disabled, even if one does have a relapse at some point. Um, and we are seeing from the Department of Justice really an increase in protections for people who have substance use disorder under the ADA. Can someone switch the slide? An update uh, while we were talking yesterday. Some oh, there's definitely talking. Okay. Um, so I want to just emphasize really that there is a significant intersection between disability law and child welfare law. The ADA and Section 504 of the REAB Act do apply to the child welfare system. Um, Title II of the ADA also applies to public entities. Um, that would include state and local governments, as well as your departments and agencies, and that would also include courts. So courts have to comply with the ADA. And then we have to switch slides. So then what does the ADA require? And this is very um, detailed sort of what the ADA does require of the child welfare system. So first, it must provide individuals with disabilities an equal opportunity to participate in their programs, their services, and their activities, including providing reasonable modifications, unless those modifications would somehow fundamentally alter the nature of that program activity or service. Child welfare agencies also must administer their services, programs, and activities in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of the individual with a disability. Um, they can't impose or apply any sort of eligibility criteria that would screen out or tend to screen out any person with a disability from fully and equally enjoying any service program or activity. So they can't just use arbitrary um, limit sort of criteria on eligibility um, that would screen out or tend to screen out people with disabilities. Next slide. They also have to provide auxiliary aids and services when needed to ensure effective communication. Auxiliary aids and services are really anything that can facilitate effective communication. It might be sign language interpreters, it might be captioning, it might be braille, it might be a digital format, anything that can make communication accessible it would be an auxiliary aid and service. They also, and I think this is important to understand, the ADA does require that agencies provide as needed benefits, services, or advantages beyond those required by the regulation. So it really understands that in order to level the playing field, the child welfare agency might have to go beyond sort of what they generally provide to families. Um, and that is something that the ADA explicitly requires. It's also important to understand that child welfare agencies may not impose surcharges to cover the costs of any uh, modifications they're providing. They cannot charge families for these. Um, they also cannot deny any sort of benefits, programs, or activities or services to a parent with a disability or to a person with a disability simply because it's inaccessible. For example, they can't just say, we'd love to have you in this parenting class. Unfortunately, it's not in an accessible location. Well, the ADA would require that they move it then to an accessible location. 
And they also must provide services, programs, and activities that are readily accessible to and usable by people with disabilities. So again, there's a real focus on making sure that everything is individually um, meeting the needs of individuals with disabilities, but also that is fully accessible and able to be used by people with disabilities. Next slide. So there are a number of reasonable modifications and I will start by saying this is just examples and there is no one answer. Um, I often get calls from attorneys, well-intended attorneys or child welfare agencies, and they will give me scenarios like I have a parent and this was a real story. I have a parent, a new mom, who is in the hospital and she's paralyzed on her left side. What modifications does she need? And I said, I don't know this mother from anyone. I could be walk. I wouldn't know her if I walked by her on the street. Um, I said, I don't know because the ADA requires individualized services. And then I went on to say, did you ask the mother if she even needs any modifications? And they had not. Um, and so what I tell you that story is to emphasize it's very individual. If you've met one person with, say, an intellectual disability, you've met one person with an intellectual disability. So everything is going to be individual, need to be individualized. But these are some examples of common ones we see. Um, it might be things like increased frequency or extended length of sort of service provision. It might be providing in-home parent modeling. Um, that's really important, particularly for parents who have intellectual disabilities. It might be linking a parent with a co-parent or a mentor or for peer support. It might be tailoring parent education to meet the needs of the individual. Um, it would require providing services at an alternative home or at an individual's house. Um, often parents with disabilities are provided services at other facilities that are not their home. And those facilities are not going to be accessible to them the way that their home is. Our homes are very much adapted to meet our needs. And so it's an unfair really situation if you're expecting a parent to show their parenting skills in an inaccessible location. Other examples might be parent aides or coaches. Um, frequent reminders for appointments or services are so important. When you look at sort of case plans and sort of case notes, it, one of the things that I often see is that parent didn't attend Appointments. And if you look further, you can see that the parent may have any some sort of intellectual, cognitive, or psychiatric disability that might make it difficult to remember. And just providing that reminder service could make all the world of difference. Um, so that is a really important one. Um, accessible transportation is really important. Um, providing information, whether it's in large print or on digital format or braille, can be really important. Another thing that's really important is note taking or transcriptions of meetings and activities. A lot of people with disabilities, um, certain disabilities, they really benefit from being able to read over notes afterwards and really sort of get what happened. And so having those transcripts or those notes available is really useful for sort of understanding exactly what's going on. Some parents will need assistance reading things. Um, and then there's also, of course, sort of providing interpreters or other informal processing assistance. Um, I knew of a program several years ago, I believe it was in Vermont at the time, and they provided um, essentially interpreter services for parents who had intellectual disabilities. And that wasn't what we think of as interpreter services. It was simply someone who sat in the courtroom and explained to the parent what was going on. Um, and I think that is such a cool service. Um, and it really can be so helpful because even if you don't have an intellectual disability, it's hard to understand what's going on in courtrooms. Even when you're a lawyer, it can be hard sometimes. So imagine being a parent um, with an intellectual disability and just having that support can be really useful. Next slide. Other examples, um, daycare services or respite care, um, informal support networks can be really helpful. So finding out what is the family support network? Do they go to church? Do they have neighbors or friends? Who is available to help them? Um, parent helpers or assistants. Um, one thing that can be really helpful for parents who have low literacy or parents who have intellectual disabilities is sort of pictorial representation or reminders of tasks, sort of a step-by-step. -step. This is how you feed, feed a baby. And sort of having a chart or something that just outlines the steps. Also making sure if they have any sort of physical disability that their home is accessible, that they have adaptive equipment, that they have a physical environment that they can actually access. These are all things that if you provide to families and families have, they can strive and they can do great. Um, so you really want to make sure that these families are supported and these that is required by the ADA. Next slide. 
There are, of course, a number of exceptions or defenses, that is things that the child welfare system can raise as a reason not to provide a service. The first is fundamental alteration. Essentially, that means that if we provided this modification, this service, this change, it would completely upend sort of the program. It would make the program or the service no longer what it is. It would fundamentally change it in some way. That is not super common, but that is one. The second one is undue financial and administrative burden. So this is the one we hear from mostly. Um, it's just too expensive, they'll say. It's just gonna take too much resources, too much staffing, too much money. Um, and that is the one that is most common. It is on them to prove that there is nothing in their budget. They, the state has no money to put towards this, for example. So it is still a high burden to meet. And then the third is, this idea of direct threat um, or sa legitimate safety requirements. So the ADA does say that there are instances in which having or providing a service or allowing a certain thing to occur would directly threaten the well-being and safety of others. Um, you may see this in the instance of a parent with a disability and the state saying, you know, having them continue to raise their child would be a direct threat to the child's well-being. Um, what I will say is these direct threat defenses have to be based on objective, real reality um, and not just stereotypes. They can't just say parents with intellectual disabilities can't blah, blah, blah. It has to be real. Um, and that is explicitly in the ADA regulations that you cannot uh, make decisions based on stereotypes and misconceptions, but it has to be objective information. Next slide. So as Stacy mentioned at the beginning, the Par Department of Justice has been increasingly involved in these cases. Um, and they first started getting involved in January of 2015. And that was the Sarah Gordon case. And as Stacy said, um, this was a really important case. Um, it really was the first time that both the DOJ and the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights got involved in these types of cases. And this involved a young mom, she was 19 at the time. Um, she had an intellectual disability and she had her child removed um, shortly after she gave birth. It was within a day or two of giving birth. So she was still in the hospital. She had some difficulty feeding. She could not read an analog clock. I will note that she asked as an accommodation that her mother be able to stay with her. The hospital denied that. Um, instead, they reported her to DCF and said that because of her intellectual disabilities, she simply could not raise a child. They entirely sort of ignored the fact that her family was planning to support her. She actually lived at home. Her mother had retired early to help her. Um, so this was actually someone who was really well supported. Um, but DCF, um, in their great wisdom, said, no, we can't do this. This would be dangerous to the child. Um, Sarah and her daughter were separated for two years, three months, and 12 days. Um, and it required, it really took the involvement of the federal government to be reunited. Um, so the DOJ did this investigation along with Health and Human Services. They issued their letter of findings in January and in March, she was reunited. But again, that was two years, three months, and 12 days of being separated um, and very limited visitation in that time. That was huge though because it was, again, the first time the federal government had been involved. Fortunately, we have seen increasing attention and interest by the federal government. In August of 2015, for example, um, the DOJ and HHS issued technical assistance. If you have not seen this, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, it is great. It is technical assistance. It's a very detailed document that explains exactly what child welfare agencies must do to comply with the ADA. It provides really good examples. Um, I have seen it cited in many court decisions as well as um, attorney briefs. It is really useful language. Um, so that was a few months after the Sarah Gordon case. And then we saw a couple of years where there wasn't much other than the White House event in 2016. Um, and then in 2019, we saw Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights um, reach a voluntary resolution agreement with the state of Oregon. This case involved um, parents with intellectual disabilities who very similar to Sarah had her, their children removed right after birth based on sort of this presumption of neglect, which I know is something that Connecticut also has sort of this presumptive neglect. Um, so this idea that they will neglect their child. 
Um, and so this was a really important case. Um, a couple or about a year later, um, the Department of Justice and HHS actually came back to Massachusetts and essentially said, hey, we meant what we said in that letter of findings. You do actually need to comply with the ADA. We've continued to receive complaints. It doesn't look, at, look like you're doing that. So there was a settlement agreement with DOJ and HHS with the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families, um, which again, really just reiterated sort of that the state had to comply with their ADA obligations and that is still ongoing although I believe it's wrapping up soon. Um, and then more recently in April, 2021, there was a DOJ settlement with the state of Washington, again, involving parents with disabilities um, and a number of issues, including not providing interpreters to deaf parents and really just discriminating against parents with disabilities. Um, these are just a few of the recent enforcement activities. We do know that the Department of Justice, as well as the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights continues to investigate these cases. Um, and I often will encourage attorneys um, to file a complaint with the agencies if they feel that would be useful. Um, it's really easy to do. Anyone can do it. You just go to ada.gov to file a complaint with DOJ. Um, and HHS's Office for Civil Rights also has a similar online um, complaint. Of course, it's the federal government, so it does take a long time. But as we have seen in many other cases, it can be particularly useful, especially if there are instances in which there's clear ADA violations. Next slide. And that is it. So I am turning it over now to Bonnie and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. I think we're gonna do so I'll do that then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so we'll shift gears now. We'll hear from Bonnie. Um, about protections for youth under the ADA, um, and specifically also youth involved with the child welfare system. Um, hopefully we'll hear some more stories as well um, about cases that she's been involved in uh, to spark some ideas among our audience about what you all might be able to do as well to invoke the ADA. So Bonnie, are you out there? I am here, thank you very oh. much, Stacy. Um, and thank you, Robin. That was very comprehensive. Um, so if you will go to the next slide, please. So as everyone said, my name is Bonnie Roswig, um, and I am um, an attorney with the center. Um, Stacy told you about what the center does. I am part of our medical legal partnership, um, and that is really how I came to this ADA work. Um, where a, um, we have wonderful social workers and care coordinators in our um, hospitals across the state in our Medicaid um, clinics. And um, one of the endocrinology social workers came to me and said, Bonnie, um, my uh, patient um, has a new diagnosis of type 1 diabetes and is told that they can't return to daycare. Is that fair? You know, that doesn't seem right. A very similar query from one of the public defenders who said, Bonnie, um, I have a client who's about to be discharged um, from juvenile detention, should be going to a post-detention setting, and now is told that because they're a diabetic, um, they can't attend. So, um, you know, this work really covers, you know, so much of what we do. Um, so I'm also going to talk a little bit about the, you know, the definition of the ADA um, and how we all can work with it and what a really powerful tool it is uh, in terms of client representation so, and protection. So next slide, please. So, you know, as Robin said, um, the ADA is really all about inclusion. It is about reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures. Um, just because someone has a healthcare condition does not give open the door to a denial of access to participation in that program. And the global obligation is to not only include the youth with the healthcare condition, but also a parent or a guardian because they also, the ADA requires that they are afforded modifications so that they can fully participate and integrate into whatever program is moving forward. Next slide, please. So 
I have to say, I am an ADA nerd. I am really moved by the language itself of the act. And even though sometimes um, it seems difficult to wrap around how you use the ADA, um, but it's really very simple. And, and the way that I start is just to read and embrace the language. There, there's two sections of the ADA and Robin talked about 504, which is very similar um, in terms of its language and, it, and its power. Um, but Title II says, which we'll talk about applies to government entities, um, says, no qualified individual shall, on the basis of disability, be excluded from participation in or denied the benefits of the services, programs, or activities of a public entity or be subject to discrimination by any public entity. That language is incredibly powerful and has to be taken on its face. Next slide, please. So this is Title II is about state and government programs. City, municipal programs, um, they are required to provide individuals with disabilities equal opportunity to benefit from their services, programs, activities. And for an individual with a disability, they are required to make reasonable modifications to programs, practices, and procedures. It's about inclusion. It is about leveling the playing field. Um, so that when you hear that someone, no, sorry, you know, this individual, we can't take them, we can't accept them, um, this won't work. Um, the first thing, you know, to do is not to say, oh dear, what do I do now? But the first thing to say is, wait a minute, that's illegal, that's a violation of federal law. Um, we also have Title III of the ADA, um, which is, uh, ADA is global. Um, ADA applies not only to public, but to private sector as well. Um, and people think it's just based on federal funding, and that's just not true. The ADA cover is a global protection. Um, Robin talked about the exclusions, but they are very few, and it is a really high standard to meet those exceptions. So Title III says, no individual shall be discriminated against on the basis of disability in the full an equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages of any place of public accommodation by any private entity. So that includes, you know, camps, daycare centers, private rehab centers, um, you know, private hospitals. Everyone must go through this process of accommodating. Next slide, please. So a, a private entity is, you know, the jargon is, they're called a, a place of public accommodations. And again, everyone should be allowed or provided the opportunity to benefit from their programs. Uh, and they are required to make reasonable modifications to programs, practices, and procedures. So, you know, a modification, does, is there effort on their part? Oh, yes but they are obligated to do that because they operate in the United States and federal law mandates that they make these modifications. It is, it is if it's inconvenient, um, you know, that, that, is not, that is not a barrier. They have to put in the effort to provide these modified program practices and procedures. Next slide, please. So in terms of the protecting our youth, um, there cannot be a blanket denial based on a disability diagnosis. There can never be, sorry, you know, Johnny cannot go into this um, post-detention setting because he's a diabetic. Um, or there can no blanket denial based on a need for medication. Oh no, you know, we don't, we don't provide medication. Um, we don't have anybody here to do it. Um, and any time a really important component of that ADA violation, as Robin mentioned, was this individualized assessment. If an entity is worried about 
meeting the needs of an individual with a healthcare condition, then they are under the ADA, they were required to go through what we call an individualized assessment, really to make a determination of how we can include this individual, what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and, and how to ensure that uh, the individual can participate. Because any assessment never starts with, oh, sorry, can't do it. Person has a healthcare condition, we don't know what to do. But it's supposed to start with, how can we make this happen? Next slide, please. So, you know, who is our, you know, typical case and case that we have gotten from some of you participating today? You know, it's our client, you know, he's 16. Uh, he's been, there is a, an agreed upon placement uh, in a contracted residential facility. He's a type one diabetic, he does require insulin, but all of a sudden, you know, the placement, which was so hard to put together um, and required so many checkoffs to, to make this happen, all of a sudden they're saying, no, sorry, we don't have a nurse, can't do it. Um, this is not okay. And this, you know, certainly goes in the direction of being an ADA violation. Next slide, please. So what is their obligation? Um, they are absolutely, in this instance, required to provide the reasonable modification. Now, every individual, particularly young people um, with a healthcare condition, and diabetes is just a very easy example, um, they all have a healthcare plan, and which is created by their healthcare provider. Um, and frankly, in the state of Connecticut, if it is in the Hartford area, they're going to be served by endocrinology at Connecticut Children's Medical Center, um, and they, or they're going to be served by endocrinology at Yale. And, and in terms of practical advice, um, these departments are just an incredible support system, you know, for our clients. They know, you know, what, what the individual, what the youth or what the child needs. And they have a range of experience. It's not just helping kids get into camp. It's getting kids into, you know, residential mental health facilities, residential, you know, post-detention facilities. They appreciate um, the challenges of some of these residential settings. And they have, um, they can put healthcare plans into place that make it um, possible for the medical treatment to be provided, you know, in a way that's reasonable, that's not overwhelming for the facility, and that keeps the young person safe. Um, one of our sort of challenging laws, which I've had a lot of conversations with um, healthcare providers around, is the Connecticut law, which requires that injections be done by licensed healthcare providers in state-run facilities. This is not specifically um, a medical necessity. Um, it is a state law in Connecticut, and we go back and forth around its, it, the fact that it, whether it's uh, medically required and whether or not it therefore becomes a barrier um, to participation in some settings. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of, you know, the, for example, the juvenile residential facilities, um, these can be private. So therefore, they are absolutely required um, to provide reasonable modifications. Again, those, um, the medical supports required are in the healthcare plan. Um, and, you know, a conversation with the medical provider and frankly, the medical provider having the discussion with any entity that is nervous about having this child in terms of what they need to do and what is required. Um, you know, the healthcare plan, if the medical provider says that the patient does not require a nurse to, for example, oversee the diabetes treatment, then it's not necessary. And there are many, many settings in Connecticut where non-medical staff, it is totally medically appropriate and medically safe 
for a trained individual um, to provide the health care. For example, uh, in a camp setting, um, non-medical staff could provide uh, insulin injections. We now have technology where a lot of that uh, is now not necessarily and outdated, but nonetheless, um, you do not have to be a nurse or a doctor um, in many instances. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, again, for our kids, you know, we've talked about diabetes, um, both, um, and again, these have come up not only in, you know, for little children, but, you know, the challenges of getting our youth into um, appropriate settings, for residential mental health, residential post-detention. Um, it is a, it should not ever be a barrier. And yet I've had, you know, conversations with many of you around, you know, how is, how is this young person being denied, you know, this benefit um, simply by virtue of having this, you know, comorbid diagnosis. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing, you know, as um, Robin was alluding to, the accommodation, the modification, um, is the obligation of whatever facility is serving uh, the individual. So, you know, it is not the job of the parent. Um, <laughs> these facilities cannot insist that the young person do their own care. I have seen um, plans where, you know, contracts um, between the child and the facility saying, yes, the nine-year-old must oversee their own, their own, you know, diabetes care, or even the 13 or 14-year-old. Can they physically do it? Yes. Do we want them to be totally on their own doing it? Absolutely not. Um, this facility cannot insist that the parent come and do the treatment, um, nor can they insist that the parent pay for the medical care or for the training for staff um, so that the staff can learn how to provide the treatment. These are all ADA requirements. Next slide, please. So, you know, we, Robin talked about um, the issues around, um, you know, the ADA requirements um, for individuals with intellectual disabilities, mental health disabilities, you know, and we have had these cases as well where you know, a client like Mary, she has a diagnosis of anxiety disorder, there is a history of domestic violence, and her four and six-year-old are currently in foster placement. And the problem is, you know, there is a unification um, you know, plan, but Mary's mental health condition is impacting her ability to comply with that parenting plan. Next slide, please. You know, again, um, the ADA requires that um, that Mary and any individual in that situation um, be provided with, you know, reasonable modifications. And, you know, starting with what does that parenting plan look like? Um, and, you know, it's really hard because generally the clients are going to say, oh, you know, I have an anxiety disorder and therefore I am not going to be able to comply with this plan. Um, you know, it's sort of, you know, probing conversations with the client. What's the client's history? What's the client's challenges with complying with plans? Does, you know, if that parenting plan includes locating a class, being in, in treatment, you know, can that parent do that? Does their, you know, diagnosis prevent them from just sort of checking off the list and doing what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, sometimes this is a, you know, difficult, it, people aren't thinking about it, but it's really, um, it's something that the parent really needs support with in terms of effectuating that parenting plan. Um, and the ADA requires that there is, you know, Robin talked about the individualized assessment. And there is just no laundry list under the ADA. This is what we provide, and this is it. That does not exist. An individual's healthcare condition affects them individually, and therefore the accommodations, the modifications must speak to their particular challenges. 
Um, you know, Robin talked about the Sarah Gordon case. Um, I won't reiterate that, but it you absolutely read the letter and the technical assistance. It lays out the requirements of the department very, very clearly. Um, we and and my sort of you know uh, commercial interruption here is that we have an incredibly supportive um, uh, office of the U.S. Attorney here in Connecticut, and Bill Brown, I think originally had signed up um, for this presentation. I don't know if he's on the on the webinar. But their office is very, very supportive um, of, you know, in, of looking into these cases, talking about them, a uh, telephone call um, to their office, I understand Bill is in the webinar, um, just to even walk through, is this the kind of case that, you know, that, that they would be willing to look in, at further? Um, we started a process of looking into um, the issues that arose in Sarah Gord the Sarah Gordon case. It is sometimes a challenge um, to to get the clients um, for them to, you know, the, I guess it it is, I think in the mental health area, it is more of a challenge in terms of, providing reasonable accommodations, getting the clients to self-identify, um, and then putting together the required accommodations. But um, it is certainly, um, you know, we have the resources here in Connecticut to have those conversations um, and to pursue protections, you know, for our clients with disabilities. So I really, you know, urge you to, if you have a case that you think um, you know, fits into that the category, you are certainly welcome to call me, connect with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and, and Bill, if the 800 number is still in effect, we can certainly um, provide that to everyone. The other wonderful resource um, that Robin also mentioned is ADA.gov. It has those letters uh, and the technical assistance that she referenced but it also is just a wealth of very accessible information about ADA requirements in all sectors. So next slide, please. Um, so yeah, we talked about, you know, what supporting your client needs in, in a child welfare case. Um, again, I have found that a very, helpful partner in all this is the individual's healthcare provider, you know, in terms of what that, you know, plan looks like, what that client needs um, to support them, that, that it, what are those essential modifications, the healthcare provider can be very helpful uh, in terms of um, putting together that plan to that, you know, obviously the first, you know, conversation is with the client, but then you know, what what makes uh, participation successful for this particular client with this particular healthcare condition. Next slide, please. So the other um, really good partner in Connecticut um, when dealing with issues of young children uh, is the Office of Early Childhood. They have partnered with us and with the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in um, putting together guidance for their licensed entities, um, which are CAMS daycare centers. But, you know, the ADA applies to everybody. So there are certain circumstances where the state does not license. That does not mean that the ADA doesn't apply. And a very effective tool in having conversations with facilities um, that talk about why they won't take your client with a disability. And they always say, oh, well, the liability, you know, someone could get hurt, I could get sued. The liability in these cases is not usually a personal injury case. The liability is the failure of the entity to comply with the ADA um, and the fines that go along with that. And our little flyer here lays some of those out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
We also use the press. Um, no facility likes to have their name in lights because they have discriminated against an individual with, with disabilities. Um, and, um, you know, these cases have um, wound up in the Harper Current, in the Connecticut Law Tribune, um, in other area papers. Um, and they talk about, and, and really, you know, the results of failure to comply, which are legal actions, which, you know, if the U.S. Attorney's Office makes a determination, then they will open an investigation and they will um, put together a compliance plan, which includes oversight and can include fines. Um, and, and the other, um, and, and it is not something that an entity wants to go through, or certainly more than once. Next slide, please. Um, you know, I, we, one of our current challenges, I referenced it briefly, is, you know, our children with, our young people with mental health uh, and behavioral health issues, um, which has really so come to the forefront because of COVID, um, we find that these cases um, exist and there are continuing issues around um, inappropriate discrimination against children with mental and behavioral health issues. Again, no one can say um, that, oh, a child has an IEP, therefore we won't accept him, or oh, a child is on the spectrum and they cannot attend. Um, in terms of, you know, what the results were um, in this particular case, you know, we did file a complaint um, that was opened by the U.S. Attorney's Office and investigated. The facility was required to change their practices. Included in that settlement agreement was training for staff, notice for parents and all applicants, monetary damages to parents, um, continuing oversight by DOJ, and of course, the story wound up in the press. Next slide, please. Um, you know, I have also included, you know, a number, a couple of other just cases that we brought. Um, a There was a special ed student who the condo complex that he lived in told the parent that he was not allowed to have door to door transportation. That is a violation of the, ho of the Fair Housing Act. Very similar protections. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then we had um, Connecticut had one of the very first um, our, uh, cases that was decided under the architectural requirements of the ADA. Um, it was a newer provision, um, but there was a child um, who was, you know, had real problems in terms of ambulating, and thus it was the school's position that her appropriate playground activity was watching the other children play. Um, the uh, DOJ had their um, architect come in, um, a complaint was filed, they had to create a, um, an accessible playground. Um, and so these case, Connecticut is at the forefront of many of these cases. And if this link works, um, the mom was just so thrilled um, for her child because she had fought so hard for so many years to get her child access. And it was really the involvement uh, of, the, of the Justice Department that made this actually happen. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to talk really briefly about the exceptions um, that um, Robin mentioned. Um, they are, it's a really high standard. So when someone says, oh, we don't have the money to do that, then DOJ says, great, open up your books and show us why you can't afford, you know, a nurse for $150 an hour to come in and train your staff. Or, you know, in the, you know, case of fundamental alteration, you know, tell us why, you know, one of your staff person can't give this child who um, maybe needs a little extra attention um, or, you know, get, rather than being told, okay, you know, pick up all the toys at the end of the day, you know, how about pick up the blue Legos and put them in the blue box. That is not such an enormous effort. That is not such a fundamental alteration 
that this one staff person do this small task. Um, and in terms of you know danger to others, that is not an independent determination that the facility makes. It is the standard is, you know, what is, what is the medical standard? What do the medical professionals say in terms of this individual as being a risk? So just because there's pushback does not mean that, you know, that is the final word. So um, that is our my presentation for today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I'm sure Robin and I would be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Yeah, if, pe if people want, I know we had said you can put questions in the chat, but if it's easier for people to unmute and ask, um, feel free to do that as well. I, well, before I let you do that, I do have a question myself, um, maybe on behalf of others, but so practically speaking, um, so, you know, now that we've learned about more about the ADA and how DCF uh, or others may be violating it and and we become aware that there is a violation short of going on to ada.gov and filing a complaint um what you know practically speaking do you have any recommendations um would it just be pointing out to the caseworker which you know i think with varying degrees of success you can say hey you're violating the ada you need you know how about this modification but if they if they don't think they're violating it or they don't want to provide the modification, are there other steps to take prior to filing a complaint? Yeah, I can start with this. Um, so one of the things I tell uh, anyone that's working with uh, parents is you always want to sort of create that paper trail. So you want to request reasonable modifications as soon as you're involved with the case. You want to really create that record that the person has a disability that they are requesting modifications, that they've been denied something be, um, in violation of the ADA. You really want to sort of create that. So whether it's writing a letter requesting a reasonable modification, filing a motion for a modification in the courts, um, you just want to continue that. I think one thing that Bonnie, you mentioned that's worth also just emphasizing is some parents do not want to identify as having a disability. And that is um, a challenge. I think it's also an understandable challenge. Um, if you know we, parents with disabilities they know there's a lot of discrimination against them so why would they want to sort of out themselves um and so i think you know the thing i always try to explain to parents is if you identify as having a disability then it's sort of an extra set of armor you get to then raise these protections that you otherwise would not be able to raise them um Ultimately, it's going to be the client's decision whether they decide or not. But I think you try to emphasize that. The other thing is a lot of clients aren't going to come into your office and say, hey, I'm disabled. Um, some for a variety of reasons, stigma, et cetera. And so it's really going to sort of be teasing out whether the person has a disability. And I think in child welfare cases, attorneys should just screen every client because the vast majority do have disabilities. Um, and it's things like, hey, when you were in school, did you get special education? Do you get SSI by any chance? Do you take any antidepressants? Um, what types of medications do you take? Do you have trouble walking or picking up things? It's sort of asking if they have a disability without explicitly asking if they have a disability, because that can open the door for these conversations, which are needed because you can't use the ADA if the person doesn't have a disability. Um, so you have to get them to that place. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then in terms of, you know, mental health as a disability, um, I mean, do, would you think it would be reasonable if a parent were to say, for example, that their anxiety was, you know, getting in the way of them attending visits, um, to use that to then request visits be at their home or somewhere more comfortable to them? And like, how, how do you go about doing that? I mean, I think what you need to do is you need to connect the disability. So in this case, maybe it's anxiety with the modification that you're asking for. So, you know, because of my disability, I am unable to do X and therefore want to do Y instead. I want to have home visits instead. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of this just requires conversations. I was talking with an attorney several years ago, and I will never forget this, but one of the attorneys was working with a parent and her, she had mental health disabilities and she was on medication 
and she kept she got involved with the system because her child wasn't going to school on time um and so ultimately the attorney finally had the sort of um thought process let me ask why the mom's not bringing the kid to school on time and it was because her medication made her sleep so all they needed to do was adjust the time of her medication and the quote unquote problem went away so it is again you have to have these conversations even if they're uncomfortable and in that suit situation it was just a very easily solvable problem but no one had thought to everyone always blames parents without ever thinking to ask um, and I think that was really important in that situation the, the other thing I want to add is that so if you say you know oh based on my client's disability we need to modify the visitation to you know at home or whatever if the response is oh no we don't do that you know that that is a violation of the ADA there is no, there can be no such thing as, um, you know, we don't do that. And therefore, um, the whole point um, of the ADA is an accommodation. It does a, a modification of policy, practices, and procedures. And so that that is your first sort of indication that you have a problem. And that just because someone says, no, we don't do that, or we don't provide that, um, doesn't mean that that's the end of the conversation. And so then what then going up the chain of command? Yeah, ab absolutely going up the chain of command, Stacy. And I think that, you know, one of the things that, you know, we start with in terms of, you know, colleagues around the state in the US Attorney's Office is if we're if we're identifying an ongoing issue, systemic issue that we're seeing again and again and again from one you know, entity, agency, you know, let's have a more global conversation um, in the higher domains and then do a training, um, a specific training for that sp the specific staff who just doesn't understand their obligations. I mean, we can sue them first, but, you know, sometimes it is more productive to set out the ground rules um, in the sort of framework of a training and then and then go from there. I know, I know a case that you and that you and I had together, Bonnie, within the last few months, but you know, it, it involved a youth in DCF care. Uh, I think she was over 18, but trying to access uh, higher education services and nobody in the chain of command could conceptualize how they were violating the ADA by not even um, recommending that she go a higher education route. They kept pushing her toward vocational training. And I know we had a meeting with, we ultimately asked for a meeting with DCF Legal to point out to them how this was a violation of the ADA. And that didn't work. And then it, it was at that point that it was like, okay, it feels like it's time for a complaint. We're not getting, you know, we've, we've exhausted trying to advocate internally to open people's eyes, so. Right. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think you come to a point where you try and then, you know, you need a little more, um, you know, you need to take it to the next level because, you know, it is not the way um, it is, you know, in some way, even though, you know, from my seat, it, it is is very plain on its face what the obligation is. Um, in many situations, it is not intuitive. So sometimes, you know, people are brought along easily. Um, I've had cases where as soon as, you know, I say ADA, um, you know, particularly if an attorney is involved, they understand and they, um, you know, they advise their clients accordingly. And sometimes even, you know, the attorneys don't understand. So particularly there's so much at risk in the child welfare setting that, you know, we need to advocate um, if we see that there's a problem in any way that we see is necessary. I see a question in our chat that somewhat related um, a student with a 504 and documented severe disability being denied in college a, a modification um, mother tried to talk to the legal department and she was denied access to talking to them any suggestions so I can start because I work in a school so I know sort of that side of it um, and I know the student side because I've experienced it so the first thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is IEPs and 504 plans do not apply to colleges. Um, and I think that's a big shock to families when they get to college and they're like, well, here's my IEP or here's my 504 plan. 
not relevant any longer. Um, the of course, colleges, universities, they have to comply with the ADA and 504. Um, so they do have to provide accommodations. Um, so I, you know, and I'm not claiming they're perfect because I think universities do a terrible job, but uh, they are required to uh, provide accommodations. As for the part about the mother, so there is a federal law for, for um, Federal Educational Records and Privacy Act that prevents um, anyone from talking to schools, but you can sign um, a, a consent form that would allow a parent to call. But that is true, actually. They would not be allowed to talk to a parent without the student's permission. Um, so the student can give the permission and then they are allowed to talk, but that is actually true, that part. Um, but again, I'm, schools do a really terrible job, but you want to sort of go to your disability resources services and say, listen, I had a 504 plan in school. These are what I used in school. This was really helpful. How can we get similar services once we in college now? And Bonnie might have more, but that was- Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> yep. That, that's totally the framework, Robin. It is, it is an effort in the post-secondary setting to get accommodations. And um, it is, you have to be proactive about getting them just because you had accommodations uh, in, in a public school setting or in a pre-12 setting, um, you have to go, you have to request them. The healthcare provider has to attest to the fact that this is an individual with a disability. And then again, in the post-secondary setting, they don't, necessarily understand my apologies to anyone who's on um who is in that setting but for example i've had numerous you know oh well we can't allow this child to or this student to participate remotely because the professor won't allow it i am very sorry you know the professor and and the professor what the professor says goes it's what the ADA says goes that the professor does not trump ADA. So and and moving post secondary facilities in that direction, you know. And again, as we mentioned earlier, uh, a student with a mental health disability and what accommodations need to be provided, they are less able to wrap around what that is. But you know, again, they are sometimes the very practical, you know, accommodations. Should this student have a roommate? Is that safer for them? Should they not? Should they, you know, what do they need, you know, ongoing supports from the mental health team on campus? Do they, can they get, if it's, if it's a stressful time, if it's midterms, if it's finals, um, do they need an accommodation in terms of due dates or extensions? All of those things are you know, reasonable. And it, there, again, there is no such thing as, sorry, we don't provide that, we don't do that. It is, you know, as Robin said, an individualized determination based on this individual's um, disability related. I think the big shock to families, though, is they assume the IEP or 504 plans just translate um, and you're going to get the same services, and you do not. Um, schools are really, they do not make it easy. Like, a professor that always provides the accommodations that are requested, but there is sort of that barrier. Uh, and I, I know that I'm not the expert here, but I, I would also want to stress um, the importance that both Bonnie and Robin mentioned of um, educating and including um, the person with a disability about, you know, the modifications and entitlements that they're entitled to. Um, I've seen far too many times that, you know, IEPs will be put in place or modifications will be put in place, but then it's not actually followed. And I have a student now that I'm working with, he's probably 20, he's a, at a university locally and um, is autistic and he is entitled to extensions um, as a, with his work. And he just asked for one and the professor denied him. And he's like, no, but I'm entitled to them. And good thing that he knows that it can't just be the attorneys or the, you know, other professionals involved advocating for it because, you know, it, it's ultimately it's affecting the actual person. So um, the importance of inclusion. Um, one other thing, Jay, did you want, did you have a comment or a question about the, um, the undue burden? Peace. Yeah, I, I apologize. I, I joined late and you guys may have already covered this. So if you did, um, please uh, just ignore it and tell me to pay attention next time or, or go back and watch the recording. But 
I know Bonnie and I have talked about this over the years. We've had some spirited discussions about the what constitutes really an undue burden for uh, an entity when the defense is put up that, well, that constitutes an undue burden. In my recollection, this goes back to the kind of early days of the ADA, was that it really does constitute a financial analysis uh, regarding the, um, you know, the requirement that, you know, and, and so I guess, is there, is, and, and I think you just said, uh, Robin or Bonnie, about it being an individualized evaluation, but um, is there really, is there some kind of formula uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the ADA guidance provides, um, you know, the difference between a large um, conglomerate uh, uh, daycare uh, facility that, you know, operates in 50 states versus a, uh, you know, standalone, which has a small staff, but yet um, the hiring of one additional person might kind of break their budget. How, and if you've already done this, just to, you know, we can talk offline, but what is the, you know, thumbnail analysis of that and how, what is, you know, who could, who kind of gets to make the decision on that based on, is there some algorithm or is it just more of a, you know, this is our, uh, you know, this is kind of our, who we are and, you know, we, we're, we're sorry, but we just, it's, it's going to, it's going to put us out of business or at least not enable us to do the day-to-day -day work. So, uh, Jay, in my experience and in conversations with Justice Department, it, it's what is the financial situation of the facility that you're asking um, that's claiming undue burden? You know, if the little why is saying, oh, we can't afford that, you know, then the response is, okay, open your books and let's look at why central. It's not just, you know, you, you're saying you don't have the budget. You're telling us that you don't have, you can't, you know, hire a nurse to come in for $150 an hour and do a training, or you can't purchase a laptop so that you can follow this child's, you know, health issues. Um, it is, it, it really, when, when a facility claims undue burden, they really have to show that they really can't afford it. There's no, it, it's all very individualized. Um, it's, you know, what, what is the actual cost we're talking about? What, not what you're afraid the cost is about. And what do your books look like? Open them up, show us why you can't afford this. And that, and that's how that assessment um, is generally done. Uh, Robin, do you have other experience as well? No, I mean, I agree. I think it will depend on the size. Um, so the, there is no algorithm or formula um, although that would be interesting, I think, but probably challenging. And it would go against the ID, I mean, ADA's whole individualized process. Um, but it would depend on the size. So I always give students the example of Google is going to have to pay for a lot more things than so a, the business down the street that has 20 employees. Um, so it is looking at sort of the entire resources of the entity um, and comparing it to sort of the cost and looking at sort of what the burden is that it would cause the entity. Um, and that's really what courts look at. They put the burden on the defense to show that it would cause that burden. All right, thank you. Uh, anybody else want to show yourself and ask a question or have we covered it at this point? Going once, going twice? No? Um, well, thank you again to our presenters, Bonnie and Robin. Um, for sharing your time and your expertise in this arena today. Um, and obviously also for the work that you guys have all have both done in this field, um, advancing the rights of people with disabilities. Um, we appreciate that. We appreciate everybody here who attended today. Um, and as I had said earlier, the webinar was record recorded and will be accessible, uh, will be shared later. So, um, I guess if that's it, uh, we are good to go. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.